بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأقيم الصلاة وآت الزكاة وما تقدم لأنفسكم من خير تجدوه عند إن الله بما تعملون بصير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين العبد المؤيد الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد أبي القاسم مصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم أما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إن الصلاة عمود الدين One of the rules of prayer is Qibla. In fact, we have to offer our prayers in the direction of Qibla. While standing for prayer, we must make sure that we face the Qibla. And of course, it is not permissible for us to digress from that direction under any excuse. Our face, our body should be in the direction of Qibla. And as a recommended precaution, the grand religious authorities, the Maraje, have said that even our toes should be towards Qibla. And this is mandatory, this is obligatory. A prayer which is offered in any direction other than Qibla is not valid if it is an obligatory prayer, of course. Even the forgotten sajda, the forgotten tashahud, should be performed in the direction of Qibla. If we remember that we have forgotten a sajda or we have missed a tashahud, then we have to face the Qibla while performing it, while doing it. We cannot perform it in any other direction. Of course, if we are offering a mustahab prayer, a mustahab prayer, of course, a recommended prayer. It is, if you are not in a car, if you are not walking, if you are not riding, then we should offer it in the direction of Qibla. But if you are riding something, if you are walking and we want to offer the a mustahab prayer, there is no problem if we digress from the direction of Qibla. If our face is turned while walking, while driving, while uh, uh, riding in a car, for example, there is no problem, no objection, if we deviate from the direction of Qibla. Because it's a mustahab prayer, and a mustahab prayer can be offered even and in, in a direction which is not the direction of Qibla, in a direction other than the direction of Qibla. Now, a very important question arises, and that is how to ascertain the direction of Qibla. For example, uh, many people living in non-Muslim countries, many people living in a non-Muslim environment, 
have no idea about the Qibla. They do not know how to determine, how to ascertain the Qibla. What are the rules and what are the guidelines through which we can, of course, ascertain the direction of Qibla? Of course, there are certain ways, certain methods, certain means through which we can uh, ascertain the direction. If we have any means by which we can ascertain the direction of Qibla, or by which we can make ourselves certain that this is the direction of Qibla, then we have to act according to our certainty. For example, if we are certain by any means or through any means that a certain direction is the direction of Qibla, then we have to offer our prayers in that direction. But if we do not have the means to determine, if we do not have access to any means by which to determine, to ascertain the direction of Qibla, then the Maraja, the Mushtahideen have said that you can look at the mihrab of a mosque, at the altar or niche of a masjid. Look at what direction is the mihrab. Which direction is the mihrab to? And that is that provides an evidence for you to offer your prayers in that direction. Of course, it's not always uh, true to say that you have access to a mosque and you have access to certain means. You might be at a desert or on a desert and you might not have access to anything by which to determine. Again, of course, you have to look, you have to uh, guess which direction is most likely to be the direction of Qibla. If you act on your surmise, on your conjecture, and if you consider a certain direction probable to be the direction of Qibla, then of course you can offer your prayers in that direction. Sometimes you might have, for example, you might uh, you might B, you might have access to Muslim's grave, graveyard. That's also another means by which you can direction, specify or ascertain the direction of Qibla. Because Muslims dig the graves and bury their dead in the direction of Qibla. So you can find the direction by looking at a Muslim's grave and of course sometimes you might not form an idea of course if that grave belongs to a Muslim and it, and it has certain signs the the Different parts of the grave could be seen, the lower and the upper part, then of course you can find the direction of Qibla through looking at the grave. And of course, if, if even this, even if there is no such means through which you can determine and you can form an idea about the direction of Qibla, then the religious scholars have said that you can offer your prayers in any direction which is very much likely to be the direction of Qibla, even if you are not certain, because you cannot have certainty. You, can, you do not have the means through which to gain certainty. Whichever direction is more likely to be the direction of Qibla, you can offer your prayers in that direction. 
If you think there are, if you think there are two directions, the qibla, the direction of qibla is either on either side, either it is towards the east or towards the west, or towards the south or the north. Then you have to offer your prayers on both of those two, towards both of those di directions. For example, you are going to offer them the Asr and uh, the midday and afternoon prayer. The midday and afternoon prayer. First of all, offer the midday prayer in both directions. In both the directions. You cannot offer the midday prayer in one direction and then the Asr prayer, the afternoon prayer. No. First of all, offer the midday prayer and in both of the two directions. And then offer the afternoon prayer and both the directions. And if you have no idea as to which direction is the direction of Qibla, the recommended precaution is that you should offer your prayers in four directions, in four directions. First of all, as I mentioned, first of all, offer your mid in all the four directions and then offer the afternoon prayer in all those four directions. But it is only a precaution. It's only a precaution. If you think or if you consider it probable that a certain direction could be the direction of Qibla, then it's not necessary to offer your prayers in all the four directions or on all the three directions, in all the, the two directions. It, is, it would be sufficient if you offer your prayers in that specific direction. As I mentioned, your surmise, your conjecture, and the very considering it likely and probable is sufficient. You can act according to your surmise. If you do not have any means, of course, that is the answer. Any means to determine the direction of Qibla, you can offer your prayers in any direction which you consider it probable. And Any act. If you want, for example, if you want to do an act which should be done facing the Qibla, any act, any other act, like, for example, if you want to slaughter an animal, if you want to slaughter an animal, of course, one should act according to his surmise about the direction of Qibla. For example, if you want to slaughter an animal and you do not know which direction is the direction of Qibla, again the same rule, the same laws apply to the same act. Whichever direction you would like and you would consider it to be probable, then of course you can slaughter the animal. And if it is not possible to ascertain or to form an idea about the direction of Qibla, then of course you can slaughter the, the animal in any direction. Even if later you find out that the direction to which you offer, you slaughter the animal was not the direction of Qibla, the meat of the animal would be halal. And there would be no problem in eating the meat of the animal. These are the rules of Qibla. 
And the next relevant rule, of course, regarding the prayer is covering the body in prayers. Of course, generally speaking, it is necessary for, for men to cover his private parts in prayer. And for women, as far as women is concerned, it is necessary for them to cover all parts of their body except their face and their hands up to the wrist and also their feet. It is not necessary for women to cover their feet in prayers. But of course, if, if there is a, a non-mahram, if there is a stranger seeing, seeing her, then it is necessary to for her to cover her feet in prayer. But it is not necessary for her to cover her face and to cover her hands. It is necessary for men to cover their private parts and prayers. Of course, if other parts of a man's body are uncovered, it will not affect the prayers. The prayer would be valid if a man covers only the genital area, the private parts only. So if he wears a short that covers a shorts that cover her his private parts, that is sufficient and his prayer would be in order. But a woman must cover all parts of her body. She must not expose any parts of her body during prayers. Even if there is no stranger, even if there is no namahram in, in the place uh, to see her, to see her, of course, it is necessary, it is mandatory for her to cover herself. Now, sometimes some people naively and wrongly believe that if there is no one to see, to see him, then of course uh, he can offer his prayers or she can offer her prayers without any headscarf or without observing hijab or without covering uh, herself modestly. For example, for example, a woman is in a, in a closed room or, and there is no one to see her because the, the door is locked, for example, and she wants to offer the prayers. Can she offer her prayers without wearing um, a, a veil or without covering herself properly? No, she cannot and she must cover herself modestly. Because it's necessary for a woman, regardless of whether there is any mahram or non-mahram, or whether there is any people or around, around her to see her, it is necessary for her to cover herself during prayers. And of course, if there is, if there is someone, a stranger, to see her, then it is necessary for her to cover her feet also. But if there is no one to see her, then it's not necessary for her to cover her feet. And when it comes to tashahud and to a forgotten sajda, the same rule applies. She must cover herself properly. She must cover her body properly. And a man must cover her private, his private parts in order to perform the forgotten sajda or the forgotten tashahud, there is no actually discrepancy, there is no differences when it comes to these laws. And all the religious scholars, all the ulama and, and, and mujtahideen have said and are of the same view. If a person while offering prayers, comes to know that his private part is visible. <laughs>
بك يا ديان يا خالق الإنسان الله 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 يا خالق الإنسان الله 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 Is his prayer made wide if he is while offering prayers learns that his private part is of course not. The prayer is not made right. But it is necessary for him to conceal, to conceal his private parts immediately. And he should not, of course, continue offering prayers as long as his private part is visible. The moment he has concealed and has covered his private parts, then of course, his prayer would be valid if he continues and carries on his prayer. Now, if a person does not have a proper cloth to wear, then he can use anything with which to cover his private parts. If a man does not have a dress, a clean dress, he can cover himself with anything that can, that covers his private parts. And of course, he can use grass, he can use leaves of trees to cover his private parts. If a man's cloth is ritually impure, it is najis, for example, and he wants to offer his prayers. If he has water to purify or to clean the dress, he can clean it. Otherwise, he can use the same cloth to offer his prayers with it. And if he has sufficient water, for example, if his body and his clothes, both of them are impure, which one should he purify if he has only sufficient water to purify either of them, either the body or the clothes? Of course, the ulama have said, religious scholars have stated that it's necessary for him to wash himself, to purify himself, to remove the najasa from his body and to purify himself as far as the cloth is concerned since he does not have water, he can use the same cloth and his prayer will be, his prayer will be in order. And also the grand religious authorities have said that in the absence of cloth and the absence of leaves of trees and the absence of anything with which to cover one's private parts, it is necessary that one should use mud, mud to cover and conceal his private parts. The mud is the lost alternative, of course. And if a person does not have access to mud, of course, then he can, if there is no one, he can offer uh, his prayers using his hand to, con to conceal his private parts. And if there is someone who sees him, and if there are people around him who might see him, then of course he can offer his prayers in a sitting posture. He can sit down and he cannot do sajda in that, in that situation, but uh, for doing sajda he must make signs, he must make gestures. And, dear brothers and sisters, another important rule regarding the prayer is the condition for dress worn during prayers. What are the necessary conditions that should be taken into consideration while offering prayers? Of course, there are certain conditions, first of all, that as I, have, as I may have mentioned in the previous sessions, it is necessary for a person offering prayers that his clothes must be ritually pure, it must be tahir, it must be clean. 
And the next condition or the second condition is that the, the dress worn during prayer must be mubah. It, should, must, it must have come from a halal source, from a halal uh, income. And then the third condition is that, that the dress should be made of halal things. It should not be made of the parts of a dead body. For example, if it's made from the karakas or from the skin of a karakas, then the prayer would not be valid. And the fourth condition is that, and the fifth condition is that if a person who offers prayers is male, his dress must not be made of pure silk, pure silk. Now, some people use uh, wear dress that is made of silk, but is not 100% pure. The dress is made of silk, but the silk is not pure. For example, it's mixed with pure, with, with silk and something else, then in that case, if the silk is not pure, there is no problem that the, the prayer offered would be uh, valid. And the sixth condition is that if a person who offers prayers is male, his dress must not be embroidered with gold. Prayer is not valid if a person wears uh, a gold ring or a gold watch or a dress which is embroidered or which is decorated with gold. And of course, there are some certain details, certain uh, specific uh, conditions for each of the six uh, necessary conditions for dress. Inshallah, the, the details and the explanations will follow and we will explain them, we will mention them in the next session to come. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. ربنا يا ربنا يا ربنا يا ربنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا يا ربنا ربنا يا ربنا يا ربنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا يا ربنا يا ربنا ربنا يا ربنا يا ربنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا يا ربنا ربنا يا 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 ربنا